Good to see you. I thought this week at Amazing Love, we would go a little highbrow. We would class the place up a little bit by talking about art. We got to get some culture, as my grandpa would say. Get some culture. And so I want to know, um, maybe some of you have been to the Art Institute of Chicago. Does anyone have any favorite artists? I, uh, we're not very highbrow, I know. But uh, <laughs> anyone know any artists? How about that? <laughs> um, Maybe you've heard Monet, Van Gogh, right? Some impressionists, okay. Well, I wanted to start off by showing you some fantastical pieces of art. And the artist's name is actually M.C. Escher, and he has created some things that look quite illogical. Um, here was the first one he started off with. It's called uh, Waterfalls. And uh, as you look at that, um, I'm confused at how he made it look like, you know, water is both coming down and rising, and, and that's kind of weird, right? Um, illogical. Next, uh, kind of a spin-off of this kind of art is, is this, where you look at those angles and you wonder, how did they make that all make sense? And I don't get it. Um, next one is this. I see three prongs, but if I look at those lines, I'm like, I'm not sure how that third one came to be. Um, weird. Perhaps the most fantastical, though, is in West Perth, Australia. In West Perth, Australia is the Penrose Triangle. Uh, look at this. From one angle, it looks like this. From another angle, it looks like this, and from a further angle, it looks like this. Now, I don't know about you, but in the simplicity of my mind, I could stare at those things for hours, months, and years, and still not understand how they did it. Like, I guess with M.C. Escher, there was math involved, but, but that's above my pay grade when it comes to math. Like, I, I still wouldn't figure out what he did uh, to, to have that happen, right? Well, this same kind of experience is what I think you're all going to feel when we look at who God is. See, we're starting a series on the Trinity. And there is one God, and yet there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and there have been attempts to make this logical. For instance, when I grew up, I had a book with an apple on it. And, and this apple had a skin, it had fruit, and it had a core. And there were three parts to an apple, but there was one apple. And so that was an illustration. Uh, another illustration for God is this, that you can have water. Um, solid liquid gas. I'm sorry, those are really bad pictures. There's a block of cube and a cloud there. But anyway, water can be solid liquid vapor, and, and yet it's all water. Um, we were in starting point class, and there was a brilliant young man who said uh, that, that the maybe best illustration is a block of ice. Because a block of ice, you can have some of it that's melting, some of it that's still solid, and some of the steam rising, right? But as I study for preaching on the Trinity, um, everyone has told me I should avoid these kind of illustrations because that leads us to think of God in modes. That at some times he's the Father, at some times he's the Son, and sometimes he's the Holy Spirit. But the truth is, he's all of those things all the time. That's craziness. And we can stare a whole long time and, and never really understand how that all works. And so we've come upon a very important part of being a Christian. See, if you're a Christian, welcome. If you're not a Christian, welcome as well. Maybe you're wondering what the Christian life is like. And here's something that you need to know about the Christian walk. It's this. That at one point or another, the truth of God or God's truth will defy our logic. I'm not sure when it will come for you, but at one point or another, it will defy our logic. And it's funny because we have the Holy Supper today. And it's a great example. God says, Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. So we believe that the true body and true blood are in, in with and under the bread and wine. But if you tell me when this happens or, or how this happens or, or where it is, I, I couldn't tell you. In fact, heresies were evolved based on when they tried to figure out how that all makes sense. And so I, I don't understand it, but I, I believe it. And, and that's going to be true in, in your walk of faith. That there are just some things you need to accept. And I think that's why when Jesus, he was walking the earth and, and he brought a child before his disciples. And he told all those big disciples and he said, you know, unless you change and become like one of these, you cannot enter my kingdom. And what he was praising is a childlike faith that just accepts even when there is an understanding. Doesn't mean your logic is sinful. In fact, it's good to logically understand what God is telling us today through Scripture. But at one point or another, as much as you think you have God figured out or can figure him out, you'll probably have to forego your logic and just say, I believe. It's important. And so we come upon, and I say all this to understand the goal of the series on the Trinity. And, and here is what not is the goal. The goal is not to understand the Trinity. In fact, if you leave today and you can understand it and you can make it 
makes sense. You can be up here and I'll listen to you next week and I, you've learned more than me. Um, but, but our goal then is to draw comfort from what we do know. And there are things that God has made abundantly clear about what he's doing and who he is. And I think it's going to be awesome just to take a look at who he is and what he's doing for us. So let's get into it. That's our goal. Um, we're going to look into what the God, the Father, is doing on our behalf. And we're going to draw some comfort from that. And the Word of God today is one of my very favorites. I don't very often name chapters of the Bible. I've named this chapter. Uh, my, my title for it is The Worry Crusher. And I believe that if you understand and if you believe what's going on here, you will have no reason to worry. It is the worry crusher. Let's get into it. Uh, Psalm 121, middle of page 6. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. He is the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by, night, by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. This is the word of God. The worry crusher. I love it. And we hear five times, watches, 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 no slumber or sleep. And we hear he is the maker of heaven and earth. We get to have fun investigating what the Father is doing. So, so let's get into it. Uh, for this next part, I actually need a volunteer. And I'm hoping that you won't leave me high and dry. Um, a volunteer with hopefully a good sense of balance. The goal will be to try to balance this broom on your hand. And you're not going to cup it or grasp it. You're going to take this hand away and see how well you do. Um, so I wanted to tell, uh, see if there's anyone brave enough. I can do it by myself, but it's really not as fun, guys. Um, if anyone's brave enough to help me out as a volunteer, Lee. See, you sit in the front row. That's why we get. That's why as Lutherans, we all sit in the back because we know this that it can't happen when we're sitting in the back. But Lee, I thank you very much. Let's give Lee a round of applause. Help him out. Thank you, thank you. All right, so Lee. The first time, I'm going to put it in one hand, and you can guide it for now, guide it for now. And I want you to keep your focus on the top of the broom this first time. You're going to do it a couple times. So right now, you're going to see how far you balance. We're going to kind of judge how well he does. I'll guard you from the stage so you don't fall off. Um, and we're going to see how long you can do it looking at the top of the broom. You ready? Go. He's doing good. He's doing good. He could go all day, guys. We're here for two hours. You guys have no plans. All right, Lee, he's... Two hours later, still going. Oh, wow. That's, you, you have time, right? Okay, oh, no, Lee, you can stop. You can stop. Okay. Very good, right? <laughs> Lee, now, the next one we have to do is switch your focus to the bottom. So this time, you have to keep it up while keeping your focus only on the bottom. You ready? Go. <laughs> that, that was almost it, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's give Lee a round of applause. Thank you very much, Lee. There is a method to my madness, my friends. Because what I believe what happens in this life is that we get so focused on the wrong thing. Here's where I'm going. The first verse asks this fundamental question. Where does help come from, from life? And so often, I believe you come into this place looking at the wrong thing. You don't look at the bottom of the broom but maybe you do what we call navel-gazing. That you've come in today with all your problems and all your junk and everything going on in the sinful world, and you say, i got to figure it out. i got to work more. i got to be smarter. i gotta, I got to put in the hours. i got to figure out. It's all about me. i got to do it. And yet, where does the help come from? Based on verse 1. Look there again. It says, where does my help come from? Verse 2 says, my help comes from the Lord. And so this is what you need to know about true help. Real help is founded by lifting our eyes off of ourselves. Don't look at the bottom of the broom, my friends. It's not going to lead to help and balance. you got to look to the top. Not to the top of a broom, but to the top where God is and what he is doing. And get it off yourself, who is weak and not able to do the job. And that's why I'm excited for this series on the Trinity. To see what he is doing. To get that focus off of me and onto him who can do something about it. You can balance life all day, right, Lee? If you, got it on, if you got it on the right source. And so let's now look again at what the Father's doing. 
It goes on. What does the verse say? What, what, is, what does it say about the Father? It says, he is the maker of heaven and earth. Now, if he is the maker of heaven and earth, he's the maker of everything that's in the earth, which means he is the maker of me and of you. And there's tremendous comfort there. To talk about that tremendous comfort, I want to turn your attention now to cars. I'm a bit of a car guy. I hope you uh, bear with me uh, with that. And I want to tell you about the Motor Trend car of the year. Uh, it is the Tesla Model S. And that is a beautiful car, my friends. Um, if you know of Tesla, you, it's, it's good if you have their stock this year. Their stock is rising. If you're not a car guy, um, you can see them at the Oak Brook Center. There's a new uh, Tesla uh, shop. So for all you shoppers, I'm trying to wrangle you in. That's, that's about this car. And what's awesome about this car is that not only is it beautiful, but it's fully electric. Fully electric, beautiful car. More than that, it, it has over 400 horsepower you know, because that's necessary in life. Um, and, and it can go zero to 60 in about four seconds. You know, really helpful to get up speed on the interstate. You know, that's, I'm sure, you know, good. And, <laughs> and, and it's just an awesome thing. Um, more than the horsepower, it gets 73 miles per gallon electric. And I'm not sure how they quantify gallons in electric. But anyway, it's 73 miles per gallon electric, which is cool. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful work of art. Now, I wanted to create a hypothetical situation. Let's say that beautiful car is yours. And not only is it yours, but you paid it in full. And it's funny how owners of cars can have a relationship with their cars. I was listening to the radio. They said, do you have a, do you have a name for your car? And, uh, you know, uh, whether, I don't, I'm not sure if anyone has a name, but uh, uh, man van or mom van or soccer mom or I don't know what it is or uh, Betty or baby. Or, I'm not sure, but uh, it, it can be an emotional thing. Well, let's say you have such emotions about this Tesla Model S. And it's your baby, and you wax it, and you take care of it, and you vacuum it even because it's new. And you get to a point where you lend it to someone else. And let's say that someone else isn't a great driver, and you didn't know that until they come back and they have wrecked your Tesla Model S. Now, they're okay, so that's the good news, but they have wrecked your Tesla Model S. How do you feel at that point? It's a bad feeling, isn't it? I mean, I can say that about my clunker. That clunker gets a scratch, and I'm like, ah! because I own it, right? That's God looking down at you. Do you know that? I want you to know something about your life, that you are here not because it was your idea, but because it was his. See, the Bible says that he crafted you together. He knit you together in, his mo- in, in our mother's womb. And you go back to creation account as we're considering him as maker. He called everything else into being with the power of his voice. So he said, let there be light, boom, let there be stars, boom, let there be hippopotamus, and let there be cacti, and let there be duck platypus, which is really cool and he's awesome. But it just, psh, psh, psh. and then he came to people and he paused. It's almost like he was playing with Play-Doh. He took some dirt and he, he formed it. He took some time and he breathed. And there was Adam, the best, the Tesla Model S. And then he took Eve from man's rib, and he formed flesh around it. He paused and took special care, and there was Eve. Two, the crowns of his creation, that in everything, they were going to be the creation, the craftsmanship of the millennia, of eternity, that the best thing he made was you and I. And so as the best thing that he made, he cares deeply about you. And something that I think is true is this, that he cares more about us than maybe even you do about yourself because what you need to know about your life and even your body, you're just the lender. You're just the borrower. It's like if God gave you the keys and you're just kind of joyriding here. He's concerned about what you're doing in the thing because he gave you the thing. And he loves to protect and to guide. He's like, don't wreck my baby. (laughs) I love it. You know, I know you hold the keys, but don't wreck her. (laughs) So much is he concerned about you. That's awesome comfort. In fact, maybe that's why Jesus told us in our first lesson, hey, you know about life? Don't worry about it, okay? Because guess what? The creator who who made flowers so beautiful, and we just marvel at the beauty of a, a set of mums, you know, you can't dress enough. You can't go to Macy's and buy clothes enough to be dressed as good as those, and yet God is going to provide you the clothes that you need. That's what he says. He says, look at the birds, which just flock together, and we can't even count all the birds. And he says, all those birds I feed, you know, I didn't, I didn't mold birds from the dirt of the ground. I didn't put flesh around the rib of a bird. I did that for you. 
how much more valuable are you who need food and I know what you need and going to provide because I love you because you, you're just renting this thing, but I crafted it and, and I think you're awesome. I'm going to care for you. That's the goodness of the Father. He cares more about you than you even about yourself. But you know, I think this truth is also humbling. You know, I was, I was reading uh, to, to prepare to preach to you and was reading from Luther and uh, the large catechism and, and what he said about this, this of the first article about God, the Father, the Almighty, the Creator. And, um, and he had this to say from the large catechism. He said that if we believed it, that God is our, our maker, with our whole heart, then we would also act accordingly and not swagger about and, and boast and brag as if we had life, riches, power, honor, and such things of ourselves. As if we ourselves were to be feared and served. That's good truth, isn't it? That when we understand our origins and understand who's the strength about us and understand who crafted our eyes and our abilities and gave us opportunities, we say, it really isn't about me. Which makes boasting and bragging or saying, I got this apart from the, the Father, just ridiculous. Because the truth is, you don't. You wouldn't have any of it apart from Him. And yet, how many of us have come in today with that thought? It's just about me. I got to... About me, I gotta figure it out and just gotta work harder and depend on myself and, and we'll go from there. This is sin, just depending on ourselves. And it could drive us from the love of the Father. And so the real joy is being happily dependent. Happily dependent on God for both the start, which wasn't our idea, the end, which won't be our idea, as He calls us, and the middle that we're in. We're dependent on him now for everything. In fact, he knew that, that a group of Christians would be gathered today on October 13th to hear not only about what he's doing, but also how he's going to guide them. That we'd be gathered and we'd know about Jesus, the Son, who loved us so much he'd lay down his life and be forsaken by that Father so that we could be sons and daughters of that same Father. And know what we know, that we have guidance and protection now and for eternity. He will watch over your going and your coming, both now and forevermore. Dear friends, I invite you to be happily dependent on our God for all things. Now, a tangent is, yes, you do have skills and abilities. You have an engine, and you should use that engine. But, but again, we are still, even when we're using what he's given us, dependent on his strength and on him for all things. It's all right to be dependent. There's more that can be drawn as far as comfort from this passage, though. And uh, to get into this, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in our country. Um, as you know, the government has been shut down for about two weeks. And uh, just as an encouragement, it is good to pray for our leaders. It is good to pray for all those in authority and, and to ask that God give them wisdom and strength. Pray for those who are hurting. But as this goes on, it creates some serious concern for those who uh, either work for the government or receive benefits from the government. Either, um, you know, uh, collecting Social Security or, or for our veterans. I was uh, reading from USA Today that Virginia is the, the state most affected by this because of all the veterans that they have and, and all the things that they're not getting. And so the question during a government shutdown is how well is the government going to be at continuing to provide those services or employment for, for what we really need? Right? I mean, there are a lot of people uh, wondering, well, what's this all going to mean for me? I think there's comfort for all of us today, whether you're affected by government shutdown or not. And that comfort is found on base to what the Father is doing for us. And, and let me share with you a promise of God that he gave us in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 8, it says, as long as this world continues going, there will be seed time and harvest, there will be cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Which means... You can shut down a government, but you cannot shut down our God. And you cannot stop him from continuing to provide everything that you need for body and for life. It's good to have him in control, isn't it? It's good to rely on him. You know, may God continue to give you strength to do this. And I was debating on whether to uh, tell you this story. I was at the gym and out of nowhere, a guy approached me and basically opened up his life that he lost his job. And um, it was yesterday, so it was kind of like God saying, you know, preacher boy, are you going to put your money where your mouth is, your heart where, where you say in preaching? And um, 
I couldn't help but think that God gave me an opportunity to pray for him, the exact same things that we're focusing on. That even in the midst of a, a job loss, even in the midst of a down economy or where prospects are dim, to share with him that there's a Heavenly Father who cares for all of us to make sure that we have what we need for body and for life. To let him know that no one can shut down and no one can take away the preserving power of what God is doing. And that was a powerful way to share that hope. May God give you the same hope to let you know that whatever the circumstance, as your pastor, I truly believe no one can stop our God from providing what we need. This is our hope and joy in any circumstance. But you know, the uh, hope continues. Um, one of the things that uh, we also get to look on is, is what he's doing to defend us. And um, that, that's the next uh, principle we learn about this section. And uh, I think that's what Psalm does so great about uh, fleshing out is that he really is our defender. And, and it kind of gets me thinking about what if I had a bodyguard? Has anyone here ever had a bodyguard or someone protect them in a country or whatever or been a part of a posse that's big enough to have big dudes? I would like that. I don't know about you, but like I think it'd be a cool thing to have a big dude whose only job was to get my back, right? And, and uh, I don't know about you, but this would be awesome. And this is finally a picture of our Heavenly Father. And let's dwell a little bit about what he's doing to be our bodyguard. Um, let, let's get into how constant he is. Verses 3 and 4. It says, He will not let your foot slip. He watches over you, will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber or sleep. And uh, this reminds me of the Meet the Parents movie, where, you know, the father's like, That's your Heavenly Father. Not over you to see if you're in trouble, but over you to make sure that, that no harm befalls you, that nothing comes in your life that, that isn't by his will, that, that he continues to have your back, so to speak. Whether you're waking up and eating breakfast and Cheerios, whether you're at work, whether you're sleeping at night, God is like doing this thing. And he says, I don't even catch a wink of sleep. And you parents, you like sleep, but I don't even need that, all right? That's how much. And then it says how good he is at it. You know, look at verse 7. Verse 7, it says, the Lord will keep you from all harm. Now, that's how good he is. And some of you might come in here, and from the fuller context of our Christian experience, we know that there are some unpleasant circumstances, aren't there? In a sinful world, we're like, but I thought I am experiencing harm. This isn't so good. What does this mean? Well, here's what it means, I believe. That no matter what goes into our lives, God can defend us. And, and, and have something good come out of it. And, and, and think of good in a different sense, that maybe good is like an eternal good versus like an immediate good. You know, you get that? The difference between an eternal good and immediate good. And so sometimes as our father, he allows an unpleasant circumstance as a form of discipline. As fathers, have you ever been disciplined or you ever give discipline? That's not pleasant right away, is it? For either party, really. And yet it's good. It's not an immediate good. But hopefully it's a lifelong good so that you learn from it and grow. God, our Father, says, I will allow certain unpleasant circumstances into your life if you understand an eternal good a little bit better, if you are drawn to me, if you cling to me a little bit more. That's how important our relationship is. And that's how important I consider your well-being. What else do we know about keeping us from all harm? He can turn the bad things into good. Best story here is that of Joseph. Joseph was sold by his brothers as a slave. He would go into prison based on a wrong conviction. Later, he would be the second in charge of all of Egypt, and his brothers would see him, and he would have these words to share with his shocked brothers who saw him second in charge. He'd say, you intended it for harm. But God, see, see my defender, my bodyguard, he turned that harm thing into good, what is now being done. Maybe, dear friends, that harm that he allows is just a matter of fixing our eyes a little bit more, not on the top of the broom or even our God, but maybe our heavenly home. So we don't get so wrapped up in the here and now. It's a good father. It's a good father willing to allow all those things to keep us from harm. And finally, it says he's pleasant in doing this. It says, verse 5, The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. And so with God at your side, I, I kind of imagine sitting on the beach with a beach umbrella. I actually had a chance to go over to Jerusalem where there was a hot, arid, uh, dry time. It was the middle of June, and, and we were looking at some ruins, and we went into this house that was centuries old. 
And it didn't have any AC. It didn't have any doors. It was just stone. But the, the temperature change between being out in the beating sun to, to being inside and having just shade was, was huge. I could have stayed there all day. That's God. When we're found in his family, yes, life can feel like it's beating down upon us, but he will provide shade. He will provide what we need to refresh us and prove his goodness. So, this is what we know about the Father. I don't know how it all operates and how it all makes sense. He's two other things also at the same time, which we'll consider. But may you draw comfort based on what he's doing for you. May we as children just happily depend on on the goodness of our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand.